Hello, hello, hello. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Biohack Your Best Life. My name is Elizabeth, and we're doing our own intro today. That's right. <laughs> you want to sing a little jingle? Keep going. That was good. I don't know. I'm oh. Billy Carson, <laughs> a.k.a. Forbidden Knowledge. Welcome to Biohack Your Best Life. Yes, yes. Welcome, welcome, everybody. I went live on Instagram. I was trying to drive people here because we are going to have a phenomenal conversation today. Yes, we are. Hello. And if you're live, live on Instagram, everywhere. <laughs> make sure you go over to YouTube right now, the Forbidden Knowledge yes. YouTube account, the Forbidden Knowledge we have an amazing guest on tonight and we do. you don't want to miss it. All right. We have an amazing, amazing guest, you guys. So listen, so back in, I think 2021, I think we had him in on in 2021. Yeah. It's been a long time, but this man is a wealth of mm -hmm. information, a yeah. wealth of information. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to let you guys know a little bit about him and then we're going to go ahead and bring him up. And if you guys want to know anything about nutrition, okay. This is the man to ask, all right? So Dr. William Wallace holds a master's degree in exercise and nutrition science and a PhD in health and human performance with a focus in nutritional sciences. His doctoral work focused on the use of cognitive enhancement agents in college students. He has published peer-reviewed literature and conducted research in the fields of exercise and nutrition science. William has taught nutrition at the university level, focusing his teaching on supplemental nutrition. Additionally, he has extensive experience in nutraceutical in the nutraceutical field and has conducted work in every stage of research and development, including clinical research, product development, quality, and compliance. Currently, he oversees product development and quality assurance for several Midwestern nutraceutical companies serving as their chief science officer. So, wow, that's a mouthful. That's a lot. I mean, he he got some knowledge. Yeah, man has some knowledge <laughs> yes. and some real understanding of our topics the way we like to see them from our perspective as yes. well. So if you want to learn more about what we're talking about, we're talking about uh, living healthier with vitamins and minerals, mm -hmm. living healthier with vitamins and minerals. If you want to hear this amazing live podcast tonight go to the forbidden knowledge right Bye. now because we're not going to stay live for much longer because yeah. we have an amazing guest on here yes we do and without further ado y'all want to see mr dr william wallace <laughs> all right <laughs> welcome welcome <laughs> hey guys can you hear me okay Yes, yes, we can. Yes, yes, we can. Yes, we can. So thank you so much for coming back on our show. We appreciate it so much. Um, you were so good the first time. So we were like, listen, we have to yeah, have to have him back. Have back. Wealth yes. of knowledge. Mm -hmm. literally. I appreciate you guys having me. And when you had said that the last time I was on, it was like 2021. I'm like, oh, shit, was it really that long ago? Yeah. I think it was. <laughs> yeah. Time flies, right? Just like that. <laughs> time flies. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes. So for bio, but tell tell everybody a little bit about yourself. Okay. Well, I guess you cover you covered a good deal of it in the in the bio. But um, you know, I, I hold a PhD in nutritional sciences and uh supplemental nutrition specifically is uh that's my passion field. Um, you know, of course I <clears throat> I try not to over rely on things like supplements, but uh, I am very interested in and very passionate about the role that those things can play in our everyday lives and how they can improve different health outcomes. And mm -hmm. so that's, you know, largely what I've dedicated, I would say the early stages of my adult life to is, you know, investigating how we can use those things in our everyday life to improve different health outcomes. And like you had mentioned when you read the bio, at the moment, I run uh, product development and quality assurance for a couple nutraceutical companies. And you know, I've been doing that now for in upwards of six to seven years. And I, I made a transition from clinical research and academia. And then I kind of moved into clinical research in the nutraceutical field, which you know also includes functional foods. And then from there, I've kind of my position has changed a little bit. I still work a little bit with the clinical research stuff, but moved more into a product development role. And now I help oversee you know, that and quality for a couple different manufacturing companies. So, um, you know, so I guess I, I've been all over the place in the nutrition field and 
I like to think that having been involved in on the academic side of things and now in the industry side of things where we keep close relationships with people in academia, uh, I like to think that that's offered me some very unique perspectives mm -hmm. on things. And yes, so I, yes. I like to share that stuff publicly through social media. And of course, that's how, you know, that's how you guys and myself got linked that's up. How I found you. I was like, <laughs> listen, yeah. guys, what's your, what's your Instagram handle real quick so people can check you out? It is Dr. Dot William Wallace. Dr. Dot William Wallace, you guys, Dr. Dot William Wallace. So your Instagram page is, I mean, I nerd out on that like for hours, okay? <laughs> hours and hours. Yeah. So interesting story, which I talked about on my live um, live Instagram, was when we went to the doctor, Billy and I had gone to the doctor, right? And we had this little intake. First of all, the lady was about 300 pounds. Yeah. Second, she sat us down and her and the doctor were like, okay, so what supplements do you take? Or what do you take? And so I was listening, all, rattling off all these different supplements. And the lady was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. She was like, no, yeah. this is horrible. Don't do this. This is terrible for you. You get this from your food. Don't do it. So she basically told me to stop my regimen yeah, and to just supplements. Yeah, depend on my food for, for everything. So yeah. what do you think about that, doctor? <laughs> well, <coughs> excuse me. Well, man, this is such a, gosh, I hate to be, I hate to sound so horribly cliche all the time. Uh, this is really one of those depend things, you know, because everybody like everybody's needs are, needs vary so much from person to person and also mm -hmm. like dietary habits vary so much from person to person so you know something like and I, I think you guys maybe even you know more so than me because you guys you know i travel maybe once a month for work and usually it's not horribly far from where i am like maybe to different states and maybe to europe once or twice a year but you guys are going all over the place all the time it seems you know so so I would imagine that being health focused, health conscious, that you guys have routines that you have found to stick to when you're traveling, maybe certain uh, quick food items that you can rely on. You've probably found a certain set of supplements that you guys seem to think works for you. So, you know, and, and a lot of that stuff probably remains consistent. But of course, there's some, <laughs> excuse me, variation as you go from place to place with, <clears throat> excuse my cough with somebody like myself where day to day is so routine for me not much change outside of some of the problems i face you know, in the work environment not much changes for me day to day like a lot of the foods i eat are the same you know of course variation is important but uh, my supplemental regimen is also largely the same with slight variations depending on if i if i need something specific situationally we'll say so <clears throat> what i have found in my life is that what works for me and like some of the foods that I respond better to, because, you know, there's some foods I just, I, I outright respond horribly to like dairy is one of those things I have an mm -hmm. actual dairy allergy. And so, you know, that eliminates a lot of possible nutrients I could be getting from dairy, which is typically nutritionally dense food. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the foods I eat day to day, they work for me to maybe prepare them quick in certain situations or eat them quickly while I'm at work and have a very busy schedule. And so what I found that even though I try to vary my foods throughout the day, if I go get blood work done or certain biomarker testing, I'll find that there <coughs> are some <clears throat> essential nutrients, usually micronutrients, that my blood work comes up a little bit low on. And I'm like, well, shit, you know, like I thought that I was covering for some of these things and it turns out that I just wasn't doing enough of that. But in my, in my case, it made more sense for me to then supplement with some of those items just because one, like, you know, I'm fortunate enough to be able to afford those things. They're widely available to me, but it makes my life easier without having to restructure some diet items that would be more, we call it cumbersome or difficult. It might increase, increase like food preparation time or something. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the same, <laughs> excuse me, I think that, and that's really what the role of supplements is and should be in most people's lives. I like, I'm a relatively healthy person and it seems like you guys are the same. There are other people that may not be in the same health boat. 
and they may need to rely more so on like exogenous agents that are not coming from food. And when you reference people, say like a, a medical doctor's office, now if this was, I'm assuming this was like an intake nurse, mm -hmm. those people tend to have very, very little training um, in the nutrition field in general, not, you know, supplementation is, that's also its own subfield with its own challenges to tackle, but they usually have very little nutritional training. And, you know, if they were to tell you, hey, throw out all these supplements, you don't need them, you can get them all from food. If you were to respond with, okay, and like, if you know better then let me know, how do I get the, how do I get enough of all these things for me with food? more than likely she probably wouldn't have been able to give you a sufficiently good answer. Mm -hmm. Facts. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's super true. Yeah. That's super true. And I like that. So, so you tend to supplement because it's easier than preparing this exotic meal that would give you the same type of whatever it is that, yeah, you supplement with. So, so what, from what I've researched, I know for a fact that, uh, through pesticides and through a lot, you know, we've ended up killing our soil. So there's hardly any microbes in our soil. We have a lot of dead soil, especially in America, right? So, so a lot of us are not getting the same nutrients that we used to get from our foods because our soil is stripped. So what do you say about that? I mean, I know that there's a magnesium deficiency in our country, um, among other many other things. So what do you suggest for that? Or what do you what do you you know, think about that. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> when it comes to like deficiency rates, those ones are interesting. There's a lot of misconceptions around deficiency rates in the United States. Um, a lot of, a lot of the actual data that we have to support claims around deficiency rates, it, that is usually all survey based data, which has, you know, I mean, so many limitations that it's, it's hard to count. Uh, you know, it's very relying on somebody's recall of what they ate, especially in like one or two 24 hour periods and then extrapolating that out to an entire year's worth of food. That's not a very reliable way or it's not a very reliable reflection of somebody's diet because, you know, like I had mentioned, maybe for some of us, some of our diets are pretty or fairly routine and, you know, nearly don't change. But for the average American, you know, one day of eating is not reflective at all of what they're eating day to day. Day to day diet varies quite a bit <clears throat> for most people. So we do have data that suggests, you know, that data, it's not useless by any means. It's not useless. What it can do is it allows us to get wide, wide, you know, uh, let's say massive data sets across many, many people. And what it does is give us suggestions or indicators as to what might possibly be going on with somebody's diet. And so magnesium is a big one. It's actually not as big as a lot of people think in terms of potential deficiency. I think that in the, let's see, nine to 18 year old range, the about 40% of the U S population reports insufficient amounts of magnesium in their diet. For adults 18 and older, it's about 60%. But reporting insufficient intake over the course of one or two days, you know, insufficiency also doesn't necessarily mean deficiency. There's like a, a stage between adequacy and deficiency, and insufficiency is in between there where <clears throat> that kind of characterizes maybe a depletion of uh, essential elements or vitamins and potentially changes that are happening at a cellular level. But even then, you may or may not be experiencing side effects of a mild deficiency. And if you were in that stage, the symptoms would be nonspecific. It would be things like irritability, fatigue, insomnia, where it would be very difficult to actually pinpoint what the actual reason for that was. And then when you move further into an actual deficiency, then with some of these essential micronutrients, the symptoms would manifest in a way that it might be more obvious what exactly you weren't getting enough of. <clears throat> Excuse me. When it comes to soil and what exactly we're getting from, uh, say, natural foods that come from the ground. Now, there's a little, <clears throat> we play both sides of this one because it's certainly true that uh, micronutrient content 
uh, nu like nutrients in food grown from soil have gone down the past couple decades. Now, from the data that I've seen, the problem, I say the, the issue that's brought up, it's a little bit overblown, but it's not non-negligible. Like it's, it's absolutely a thing. I don't think it's a thing to the degree that people think. But the reason being is that we keep farming on the same land over and over and over again, and you're not actually, you know, moving farming practices to different plots of land and allowing maybe one spot to take some time to recover. So it is certainly an issue. And no, we aren't getting the same amounts of essential nutrients that, you know, potentially our parents and grandparents were getting when they were our age. At the same time, it's not as though we're getting nothing from food. I think that a larger issue with people not getting enough of some essential micronutrients, and in the U.S., the three biggest ones <clears throat> that have actually been marked, um, nutrients of public health concern are vitamin D, potassium, and calcium. And I think some of the bigger reasons that people aren't getting enough of these, not so much because you know, natural foods contain less nutrients, although that is the case to an extent, but more so because I think people aren't adding enough of what we would call, you know, quote unquote, that natural foods grown from the ground. I think most of people's diet, the average person comes from those in between aisles and grocery stores, as opposed to the outside aisles where you find, you know, produce, fruits and vegetables and a different kind of meats and dairy and things like that. So, so part of what you're saying is true. It might be a bit overblown in the minds of some people, but it is a non-negligible issue that, you know, if things don't change, I mean, it will, it will only get worse over time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Wow. So you said, you said potassium, calcium, and vitamin D is what, Americans are usually, that's the top three things that Americans are deficient in. Yeah. And there's, well, there's a fourth one too, and it's fiber. The reason I didn't list it just now is because technically fiber is not an essential nutrient for the reason that there is not a deficiency syndrome linked to not getting enough fiber. Like there are very obvious deficiency syndromes uh, linked to certain vitamins and minerals like with vitamin D, it would be osteomalacia in adults. If you're not getting enough, it would be rickets in children. If you don't get enough vitamin C, you'll develop scurvy. If you don't get enough thiamine, that's vitamin B1, you'll develop beriberi. And, you know, with vitamin B3, it's pellagra. And with vitamin A, it's xerophthalmia, which is also called night blindness. So there are like specific disease states that are linked to some nutrients. And that's basically why they're that's basically why we call them essential with fiber <clears throat> now fiber seems to be a really interesting case because it is non-essential yet it confers so many health benefits that the department of health and human services and the department of agriculture have deemed it a nutrient of public health concern because 97 percent of americans aren't getting recommended daily amounts of fiber. I believe vitamin D, it's 97% of Americans. And that's considering oral intake, that recommendation is assuming no solar exposure. Potassium is 95% of Americans not getting enough and calcium is about 50%. Mm. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. I know one study uh, that was done on people with more melanin than less melanin, it's hard to um, get enough vitamin D from the sun unless you get, you know, enough exposure to the sun to gain a, a good amount of vitamin D. Because I guess the skin, the melanin, it disperses it and spreads it out as radiation. Uh, so the darker you are, I believe, according to this study I read, you need to get more sun, you know, in order to observe, absorb uh, the amount of vitamin D that a person with lighter skin would have to use less sun to get the same amount. That would be correct. Actually, ep epidermal melanin is very efficient at absorbing UVB radiation. And there's actually you know, there's several studies on this topic, and it ranges depending on the color of your skin. You know, there's um, 
I believe Fitzgerald was his name. He developed something called the Fitzgerald Skin Index, which kind of like ranks people by um, like skin coloration. It's not highly reliable, but there are like some practical applications for it. You have like type one skin, which is like somebody who might be like say Eastern European who very white skin, very fair, and they could sit out in the sun for 15, 30 minutes and their skin gets red. So they burn easily, but they don't, and they don't really tan. And then you have like type two, three skin, which would be more like, I think more like somebody <clears throat> like myself, where I do have a lot of like Eastern European heritage, but also half my family's Puerto Rican. So I tan, like I tan very easily, but I get very white in, in the winter months. And so like those types of people can like, they seem to like shift, shift skin color a little bit. So, you know, if I'm more exposed to the sun in the summer, as the summer months go on, I would need to spend more time in the summer to yield as much active vitamin D that compared to earlier in the summer. And so the, the thought between that evolutionary or like why that evolutionary adaptation happened was <clears throat> it was thought to be due to people who lived in like northern latitudes. Um, you know, so we're thinking like Canada, Canada and upwards, basically, but people who lived in northern latitudes during the winter months would be more likely to experience a vitamin D deficiency. And so they may have developed more fair skin to make them more sensitive to the sun in those winter months where you have maybe people in Africa who have high sun exposure all the time and you too much UVB radiation can be dangerous. So dark pigmentation was developed to protect them in a sense from too much radiation from the sun. So somebody with very dark skin, I believe they would Fitzgerald returns like type five skin. They might need anywhere from five to 10 times the amount of UVB exposure that somebody with type one skin would need to yield the same amount of active vitamin D. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. A lot of people don't know that. That's why I brought it up. I wanted people to hear it, not just from us, but mm -hmm. from a doctor as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes, uh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. That people with darker skin, they need more vitamin D. Right. So so for a person like like Billy, for instance. So should, does that mean that he needs about five to ten times the amount of vitamin D than, let's say, a person of very, very, very fair skin? So supplement wise. If I'm dosing him with vitamin D, does that mean he needs to take way more than this super, super pale person over here? So sun exposure and oral supplementation would be two different things. But interestingly enough, it still seems as though people with darker skin, so you might call them if we were using the same index type four or five skin color, it seems to be that those people still might need two to three times more oral vitamin D compared to somebody with very fair skin to yield the same amount of active vitamin D in the body due to, you know, the rates of actually active vitamin D synthesis. Because when you take it in supplemental form as vitamin D3 cold calciferol, it has to make a couple conversions before, you know, it reaches the stage of calcitriol, which is, the hormone version of uh, vitamin D. So that one's that one's really interesting. Even though oral is different from the sun, people with very dark skin, they still might need a little bit more oral vitamin D compared to somebody who has very, very fair skin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's really important. So so we had these tests done, right? And then I was reading in my test that something something is is not optimal with my vitamin D pathways. What does that mean? Is that like I can't absorb it or what what does that mean? <laughs> well, I guess it depends on, you know, what exactly the test was and what people were measuring. You know, if <clears throat> there can be, you know, certainly gene mutations of you know, certain enzyme pathways can affect that because let's see, you take you would take cold calciferol and it would convert into 25 hydroxy cold calciferol by an enzyme called 25-hydroxylase would make that conversion in your liver. And then that moves basically over to your kidneys. And then an enzyme called 1-alpha-hydroxylase converts that into 1-25-dihydroxy-cold-calciferol. And that is what we call calcitriol, the active hormone. And then you have a 24-hydroxylase enzyme, which breaks that down and metabolizes it. And then you <clears throat> excrete it 
out of the body. So different people have, you know, different activity rates of those enzymes. <clears throat> I think what is, what plays, I would say a more obvious role a lot of the time. And you say some people will take what seem to be like high, moderate to high doses of vitamin D and their vitamin D levels don't really come back very well on the blood test. And vitamin D is one of those vitamins where a blood test is pretty, it's pretty indicative of vitamin D status. So it's, it is a reliable test in that way. <clears throat> and you might wonder, well, why, like, why am I not converting as much as somebody else who's very similar features to me? And, you know, they seem to be jacking their vitamin D levels up to what they need to be and beyond. And in some cases, you know, it can go back to what you had brought up before. Some people may not be taking in uh, other essential nutrients that are necessary for that conversion, like magnesium. Mag right. yeah, magnesium is used yeah. by all of those enzymes. So every stage of the vitamin D3 to active vitamin D, if we're talking about oral mm -hmm. supplementation, magnesium is mm -hmm. needed for every single one of those conversions, as well as the breakdown of vitamin D at the end. And so that's why you'll typically hear people say a lot of the time, well, if you're taking vitamin D, then you also need magnesium. And if they're not able to elaborate on it, I mean, that's, that's the reason why. Gotcha. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting. So yeah, I knew that certain things, you should take certain vitamins and minerals together, and then you should stay not absolutely not mix certain vitamins and minerals. Is there any specific ones that, you know, stick out in your head? <clears throat> as far as like vitamin and mineral combinations yeah combinations like i know that you shouldn't take you know minerals with or you should take minerals first which help the absorption of vitamins later in the day you know different like times and and i think that there are certain vitamins and minerals that do not go together so it'll prevent the absorption of one or the other mm -hmm. so is there anything that you know of that 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 happens yeah, that's an interesting topic. So like, we call those nutrient nutrient interactions when, you know, if things are competing for absorption in the gut and <clears throat> the way that uh, I suppose that I will, what I'll suggest to most people is I wouldn't get so hung up on nutrient nutrient interactions. There's some people who get so hung up on it that you know, their entire day revolves around <laughs> schedule, like when I can eat this food item versus when I can eat that food item and take this pill versus that pill. And yeah. I was like, look, if you had any idea of all the nutrient nutrient interactions that go on in your gut when you ate a whole food meal and you were somebody who worried about that kind of stuff, you would just wind up never eating, you know? Uh, so yeah. it's not a, <clears throat> when it comes to whole food, it's not something I would really pay much attention to unless there were specific circumstances that contraindicated some kind of food items, like some people who may not be able to excrete oxalate content very well would be at high risk for kidney stones. In that case, mm -hmm. their doctor might put them on like a lower oxalate diet. But for most people that you just sit, don't simply have to do that. Um, so I'd say for most people, unless you find that you have issues, that you bring to your doctor and they instruct you otherwise, then I wouldn't really worry about like nutrient, nutrient interactions with whole food. Now, when it comes to supplements, that's different because a lot of times <laughs> you're taking in amounts of nutrients that are far higher than you would find in food. Mm -hmm. And in that case, you would have more competition for absorption between different things. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, <laughs> there are a lot of minerals that, and vitamins as well that use similar transporters to actually enter from the intestines into the bloodstream. And so in that sense, if you're providing high, like if you were providing like very high amounts of even one specific, we'll call, we'll say uh, vitamin C, about a thousand milligrams of vitamin C will saturate transporters at like any given time. You know, if, if other vitamins are sharing those transporters, then it's not like vitamin C is hogging all of those, of course, you know, there might be one vitamin that more strongly competes and there's like, you know, molecular weight plays a role in that. And so does like the valence state and like how many proton protons there are in relation to electrons. Um, but, you know, you're going to be absorbing a, a little bit of each and maybe losing some of the rest. So, <laughs> excuse me, when it comes to supplementing with something like vitamins and minerals, 
like a multivitamin, for instance, um, what I like to do, I'll, I'll use a multivitamin, for example, because we're doing like a mix of vitamins and minerals. And a lot of multivitamins will come with like a single tab, like a, you know, like a horse pill size tablet. Mm -hmm. Like take one of these a day. What I like to do is find one that splits the dose up into twice a day. And what I'll do is take one of those in the early hours of the day and then the other one in maybe like the early afternoon. And so what that does, you know, in theory, and some pharmacokinetic studies have backed this up, is that you would have more stable blood levels of those vitamins throughout the day, as opposed to if you took really high doses in the morning, you get like a spike over the first four to five hours of the day, and then uh, basically it come down. And then at night, your blood levels look far different than what they did in the morning, at least for most of those vitamins and minerals. So to keep yeah. blood levels stable and to make sure that I'm absorbing, you know, as much as my body will say needs, or even though it's a lot of times it's more than my body needs, it might be what I want. Then what I'll do is find something that I can split up and do, you know, one time in the morning, one time in the evening. But <clears throat> even when supplementing, um, I, I try to steer people away from, worrying too much be like don't you don't have to set an alarm like there's like there's six different times of the day where i take i take these pills at this hour and then these pills at this hour and these and like that's a little bit too much like for me you know it's like i like to take things i need to take in the morning most of my stuff i take in the morning if it's a multivitamin i take the second dose of that like sometime after lunch and then at nighttime I take some stuff before bed and that way it doesn't complicate my life too much. And at the same time, I, I'm, I'm yielding as much benefit from it as I can. Right. <clears throat> Quick question. Now, when we're taking these supplements, obviously, you know, it's kind of like a, a chemistry experiment in some ways. Are, do you, are there any specific supplements that you don't recommend being take, taken at the same time? Well, There are, <clears throat> excuse me, there probably are some things. I would think that rather than, it's not so much supplements that I wouldn't recommend taking at the same time. Of course, like it really depends on why you're taking these certain supplements. Like we'll give this example, like with vitamins and minerals, like I said, it's not so much something to worry about. The biggest worry is that you don't just want to be stacking too much at once because you want to be getting as much of those things in your body as you actually can or in circulation as you actually can. Mm -hmm. Now think about different goals throughout the day. If maybe you have something that's not a vitamin or a mineral that you want to take during the day for alertness. So mm -hmm. we'll say something like, um, tyrosine, tyrosine, you know, that's just an amino acid that makes a conversion into dopamine makes its conversion into norepinephrine and epinephrine. So or epinephrine, and <clears throat> taking relatively high doses of that, you know, 500 milligrams to two grams can yield an increase in alertness. And so something I may not want to take with that would be like at night, every night before I go to bed, I take uh, a bit of tryptophan. I take about a gram of tryptophan before bed and tryptophan makes its conversion into serotonin and then that converts into melatonin. And so the whole goal behind that is to be more relaxing and sedating as opposed to taking tyrosine where I'm trying to become more alert and wind myself up. Like I wouldn't take tyrosine at night with my tryptophan. And also mm -hmm. for not just because those two goals are competing, but also when it comes to amino acids, you also have this transporter, uh, I call it transporter function where if you need to take a high dose of something and it shares a transporter with another amino acid, the best strategy might be to not take those two things together. Or it's like, if I want to absorb this full, say two grams of tyrosine, which is not something I recommend people do often. That's mostly what you would do if you were in like a, a physiologically taxed state, <clears throat> like maybe like sleep deprivation of some kind, um, mm -hmm. like higher than normal. But what I wouldn't do is take that with say, like if I was having a protein for breakfast in the morning, like eggs, I wouldn't take it with that because it would be competing with those other amino acids for absorption. So I might take it on like an empty stomach or yeah. something like that, you know, and then mm -hmm. there's again, like there, that's a more nuanced example. There are very obvious examples. Like if I take melatonin to go to bed at night, 
I'm not going to mix melatonin and caffeine in the morning because my body is probably just wondering like what, what in the actual hell I'm trying to do. <laughs> you know, right. 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 Yeah. So it really, it really common sense. Sense. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Common sense stuff. Right. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Is there anything that you recommend that everybody have in their cabinet? Like what do we all need? Is there anything, is there any one thing or two things that we all need to have? For most people, I do recommend vitamin D. I don't think there are any real, they're not, I don't think there aren't any real downsides to that for most of us. Mm -hmm. I think unless you are absolutely positive that you're getting enough from the sun, then the fact of the matter is most of us just aren't getting enough. And I know that, you know, I know people out there who <coughs> argue against vitamin D supplementation for a lot of people. And that's a whole, that's a different take. I mean, I could, I mean, I, I would love to like step in the debate ring and argue those people because I feel like I, you know, I'd mop the floor with them. I think for most people, <laughs> for most people, vitamin D is, it just happens to be a must. Magnesium actually is another top one because like I had said before, like we don't, we don't really have any data showing that a lot of people in America are truly deficient in magnesium, but we have enough data to suggest that people aren't getting enough. And because they're not getting enough, they may be struggling with some of these non-specific symptoms of an insufficiency that could be increased levels of anxiety, a little bit of insomnia, and you just can't quite pinpoint what exactly is going on. So vitamin D, magnesium, I do have like a list of supplements where I, uh, what I call them is like not always needed, but generally applicable. And so vitamin D and magnesium make that list. And fiber is another one of the fiber is another one of those things that makes that list for me. Most people just aren't getting enough fiber and some of the benefits of fiber, you really just can't argue with. There's let's see, choline. Choline is another one. I think uh, there is no recommended daily allowance set for choline, but what there is is an adequate intake set. And the difference between those two things is an adequate intake is a suggestion, a suggestion that's given when there isn't enough evidence stacked up as to exactly how much men or women of a certain age need. But 97% of actually no, it's 98% of Americans are not getting enough choline, at least per the adequate intake. So choline is highly underrated. That's choline is a nutrient that's really high in animal products. Usually eggs are very high. I think one egg will yield anywhere between one large egg will yield anywhere between 90 to 100 milligrams. Men need about the adequate intake for men is about 550 milligrams a day. For women, it's about you know, 450. And if pregnant, then that goes up to about 525, <clears throat> 525 milligrams a day, I believe. And so that's one of those nutrients where it's insanely important for fetal development, but it also mm -hmm. confers lifelong benefit. So what are we at? We're at vitamin D, magnesium, fiber, choline, and then omega-3s. So you don't, omega-3 is one of those things where you don't necessarily, again, it's like, it's not always necessary, but it's widely applicable. Most people just are not getting enough omega-3 mm -hmm especially DA, EPA and DHA, and of course there are other omega-3s. It's, it's actually pretty easy to get enough omega-3 from your diet. Most people just aren't doing it. And so for that reason, I do think most people should be supplementing with omega-3s, and I certainly do. So I believe it's five, five things I listed. And so those mm -hmm. five things, those are staples for me. And when I look at the data, it turns out maybe they should be staples for a lot of other people. Like I'm certainly not one to tell people what to do, but like I said, it's widely applicable. Mm -hmm. Right. Gotcha. Yeah. So what about all of the different types of magnesium? Because there's a whole bunch of, bunch of different types of magnesium. So how do we know what type of magnesium to take and when? Yeah. So this is, this one is, it's an interesting topic because so many people are confused on magnesium, mostly because, I mean, really the supplement industry and marketing has made people so confused. 
when it comes to mm -hmm. magnesium. And so this is the not sexy answer, but this is the scientifically accurate answer <clears throat> is that the best type of magnesium, if we're talking about supplemental forms of magnesium, the best type of magnesium is the one that you can afford and tolerate. And of course, there are different bioavailability profiles across different types of magnesium, but it does seem that most forms of magnesium, even ones that are not highly absorbed like magnesium oxide, most forms are still good for maintaining magnesium adequacy status in somebody. It's not mm -hmm. obvious that all forms are great to say, pull somebody out of a deficiency, but most people aren't truly, <clears throat> truly deficient. And <clears throat> excuse me, even with the forms that have lower bioavailability like magnesium oxide, magnesium oxide still <clears throat> has a higher weight of magnesium, elemental magnesium compared to, I think all the other forms of magnesium. Magnesium oxide is about 30% magnesium by weight. And then you have some of the more bioavailable forms like glycinate, three and eight taurate, acetyl taurate. And those are like eight to 10% magnesium by weight, sometimes a little bit less. So even if magnesium oxide is getting absorbed less, you might still be getting in like an equivalent amount of the actual elemental magnesium. And of course, uh, like tis tissue distribution changes by form, like magnesium glycinate, uh, a higher proportion of magnesium glycinate will accumulate in skeletal muscle and cardiac tissue, but it can also readily enter brain tissue. Mm -hmm. Magnesium taurate and three and eight and acetyl taurate, they seem to accumulate more so in brain tissue in the short term. And then you have like citrate, which also accumulates in skeletal muscle and cardiac tissue, <clears throat> at least short term. However, if you're taking magnesium consistently, then your body is going to move around magnesium like it right. needs to. So yeah. I do think that there are situational uses, like short term situational uses for certain types of magnesium, like because acetyl taurate and three and eight acutely more are going to enter the brain more readily, then it might make sense to use those. If you say, or maybe like you're highly stressed out at night um, and you want to try to wind down quicker and get more of a sedative effect from the magnesium, because most magnesiums don't really provide a sedative effect, but three and eight and acetyl taurate actually have a little bit of data to suggest that they do and that they do reduce anxiety in the short term. Mm. The The technical health claim is mild stress because you're not allowed to use the term anxiety, but that's what it is. <laughs> so in the short term, you can use certain forms for certain things. But in the long term, all that matters is that you're taking a form that you can afford and that you can tolerate, and you're gonna have the same long-term health impacts of magnesium compared to somebody using pretty much any other form. Mm. Gotcha. gotcha. What about um, what about sea moss and bladder rack? What do you think about that supplementing with sea moss? I'm not familiar enough with sea moss. I mean, I'm aware that sea moss is, you know, it has different, uh, mostly minerals uh -huh. back inside of it, but <clears throat> I'm not familiar enough with the contents of sea moss, what specific minerals in what concentrations. I mean, would, mm -hmm. would that be equivalent to something like spirulina or chlorella? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think so. I think CMOS actually has like 90 some of the 117 minerals that your body needs or something. So, I mean, I took it for a really long time and actually healed my hypothyroidism by taking that, I believe. So mm -hmm. it, it's been effective for me. I just didn't know if you had an opinion on it. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> if it is, in fact, because I mean, from what I do know of it, which isn't much, but I, I, like I said, I do believe that it is highly concentrated in a lot of minerals. And so if that's one way that you think, if that's a strategy that you think works to get in a certain amount of essential minerals every day, like I said, like if you can, if you can afford it and it makes your life easier, then mm -hmm. I'm all for that. Like I'm not, mm -hmm. I know it's, it's popular for a lot of uh, PhDs, especially in nutrition to throw out, well, throw out the term. You don't need, you don't need supplements, uh, supplements or gimmicks, blah, blah, blah. It's like, okay, like, yeah, that's, you know, 
that's insanely unhelpful and that's insanely unhelpful advice. So if it makes your life easier, yeah, then I'm all for it. Mm -hmm. right. What's your take on uh, fulvic humic trace minerals? Fulvic acid? Yeah. Yeah, that's, um, <coughs> excuse me, fulvic acid is an interesting one because it's more of like a, if I'm not mistaken, it's more of like a tar, a tar-like mineral. It does have mm -hmm. some concentrations of other minerals in it as well. And so mostly, mostly I've seen it used for at least the attempts to use it for like improving sex hormone concentrations in men uh, and also potentially potentially maintaining something like muscle mass in, um, you know, in like a hypocaloric state. And so, I mean, like data for those specific purposes is a little underwhelming. And I also wouldn't use it I wouldn't use it as like a source really to rely on for you know, concentrations of other minerals. That is one of those, that is one of those <clears throat> like compounds or supplements that I would say is maybe a little bit overhyped for what people use it for. That's how I classify that one where it might now, it might not be outright useless, but I can't find much of a use for it where I would really recommend it to somebody even like in a very specific, like specific circumstance. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't personally pay for it and there's not mm -hmm. a condition I can think of where something else wouldn't be better for it. That's kind of how I think of that one. Like if it comes as part of like a multi ingredient product, then like cool. Um, but it's, it's really not one that I've ever recommended somebody go out of their way for. Mm. Gotcha. Interesting. What about what about mushrooms? I was going to ask about mushrooms. mushrooms. Yeah, medicinal mushrooms. What are, what's your take on medicinal mushrooms? So I, <clears throat> excuse me, I love mushrooms. Um, yeah, I think they're great. Um, you know, it's like your body. Even you know, everybody hears a lot about their, you know, their microbiome and all the important bacteria. You also have a lot of fungus in your gut, indigenous mm -hmm. fungus that play a really important role. You also have a lot of indigenous viruses too, and that's a whole other topic. But um, fungi, I think are amazing. And as much as like the hype train is rolling on those right now, there still actually isn't as much information on their health impacts as you might think. But, you know, I did see some really interesting data on like turkey tail and its usage for making like chemotherapy more toler more mm -hmm. tolerable and potentially effective in cancer patients. And my father has cancer and he's taking turkey tail right now. I have him taking turkey tail, you know, amongst several other things. But mushrooms, I do think, like I said, it's interesting because they certainly do support a lot of functions in the body. Immune functions seem to be one of the big ones for several different strains and species of mushrooms. But even then, like the, the actual evidence on mushrooms, as far as like what they do specifically, um, there's really not that much of it, but it, at least not in humans. There is a lot of interesting animal data and a lot of really promising cell data. And so I think over the next, you know, five to 10 years, we are going to see more and more data come out to actually pinpoint specific benefits of mushrooms. But I am a believer in uh, mushrooms for all kinds of things, but mostly most of the evidence points towards immune health and uh, immune function. As for everything else that they do, I mean, we'll wait and see, but uh, you know, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised to see all kinds of different benefits being purported for, for mushrooms coming out in human trials pretty soon here. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, we we take mushrooms daily. It's yeah. one of the main things that I make sure that we that we do take daily. I think yeah. we take shiitake, lion's mane, reishi, turkey tail, chaga, and cordyceps. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, we take we take all of those pretty much daily. So I'm I I can tell when I don't take them. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's like you know that's when I know for a fact that this is working for me when I can tell that I actually miss taking something like something's missing so mm -hmm. yeah yeah i i love it what's your take on um prebiotics probiotics huh. this one's <laughs> as interesting actually i think first ever um 
when I first entered the supplement industry, the, the first ever product that I developed that went to like wide commercial sale was actually a probiotic. It was a probiotic that actually had viruses in it. Um, speaking of the viruses in your gut. So <clears throat> probiotics are interesting because again, this is one where you hear a lot of different stuff from different people. Cause like, you know, I spent a lot of time with different manufacturers and suppliers of probiotics. You know, Chris Hansen's a big one. DuPont is another one. Deerland, um, Deerland's another company. And so, excuse me, these are some of the top distributors of probiotic strains in the world. And I spent a lot of time in the data of probiotics. And so there's so many different things to talk about here. So I think what I'll try to start with is like whether or not, like, do they work? Right. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> what I would say to that is there are certain conditions for which probiotics work now in order to like identify those conditions the can the conditions under which they do work are what we call strain specific so let's pick one um bifidobacterium brevi so the bifidobacterium signifies something's genus brevi signifies its species and so if i was to look at that on a supplement label like, okay i know it's genus and its species but there's something else that at least if strains are studied, <coughs> excuse me, in like clinically, not even clinically, but just have some scientific research, there'll be a string of like numbers and letters next to it. So my bifido bacteria, brevi, you know, HN one something or another. And what that number signifies, that's the strain. And what that, ser what that series of numbers and letters signifies is actually the genetic makeup of that bacterial strain. So you could have another bifidobacterium brevi that had a different series of numbers, numbers and letters that would be basically a different genetic makeup. And those two things might not actually have the same health effects in the body. So if I'm looking for a probiotic, what I do is I look for specific strains. And if I see strains on a bottle and I'm not aware of what they are, then I mean, I'll just you know, I'll try to dig them up in, in PubMed and, and Google. I'll look the strains up and see what kind of data exists because mo if there are strains, there's probably data out there for it. And then what I would do is look and see how good is the data? Is it in people? Is it in animals? Mm -hmm. Is it just, you know, sometimes uh, somebody will just like, somebody will just find the actual genetic code mm -hmm. of the strain without having any actual data for the effects of it. But <laughs> probiotics what we say are they are strains they do work but they are strain specific and they are they're basically condition condition specific and dose specific so there are some strains that work well for certain functional bowel disorders but it's specific to the strain which means there's data to show that it's been given in a certain dose to people with this specific disorder and it has alleviated x amount of symptoms now, the popular thing right now is like psychobiotics, showing that some of these strains can actually affect cognition and mood in people. So there are a lot of different strains being studied, uh, studied on their impact for something like depression and mood disorders in people. Mm -hmm. the, thing about, the thing about probiotics, and this is how, <clears throat> excuse me, it was described to me by a mentor of mine who is like light years more experienced and smarter than I am. Uh, and I consider myself pretty read up on probiotics and he's even more so. And what he had described to me was administering a strain of something like, you know, you see different bottles in the store, it'll be like you know, 20 billion international yeah. units, and 10 billion international units. And most of us would think, well, more the better, you know, more inclined to take the 20 billion international units, There's more bacteria in there. That's what I want. But Regardless of, <clears throat> excuse me, how much you're supplementing with, he likened taking a probiotic, this is how it was described to me, taking a probiotic could be likened to uh, putting a drop of dye in the ocean and expecting it to change colors. Mm. So that's, how, mm -hmm. that's how much bacteria is actually in your body. Like, so the best thing you can do is choose 
you know, bacterial species and strains that have, of course, been studied to work in the conditions that you're trying to use them for, but have also been shown to colonize, basically. And so, mm. take, you know, I think the probiotic that I had formulated once was only five to 10 billion international units, which is not very high considering some of the concentrations of probiotics on the market. But every mm. single one of those strains with the bacteriophage, which is a virus that was included with the product that showed that the, that those strains, colonized, especially in conjunction with the virus, that they grew in concentration far more quickly yeah. than if you were to take them without it and far more quickly than other strains that were similar genus and species, but had a different genetic makeup. So, <clears throat> so probiotics are interesting. They do work for certain things, but they are dose specific, condition specific, and strain specific. Mm -hmm. and, then also, and also the effects of the probiotics, they do actually tend to wear off when you stop taking them. So that's another thing to, that's another thing <coughs> to consider, especially if like, if you're taking it as you are now as a reasonably healthy person and you were to take it for a month, I mean, you could do like one of those fecal micro, microbiome tests and see changes you know, in bacteria, you know, that's winding up in your feces over the course of the month. But when you stop taking that probiotic within 30 to 60 days, assuming nothing else has changed in your life, then your microbiome and, you know, bacterial diversity kind of reverts back to what it was. So those are all kind of the things to consider when thinking about using probiotics. Right. Gotcha. Yeah. Wow. That's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Man, my brain is like pff, right now. Yeah. <laughs> I gotta, I gotta process this whole conversation because yeah. yeah, I gotta watch this over so I can get the the education. From it. mm -hmm. It's a lot Incredible. of yeah. yeah, yeah, a lot of words, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of information. Thank you. Yeah. That was that was great. Yeah. Do you have anything else? Have I any learned a lot from this. I actually, I, yeah. I learned a lot. Um, and uh, I can see where some of the regimen that we've been on is on the right track, and mm -hmm. I can also see where. Maybe some things we should look into a little deeper. But overall, uh, we're fairly healthy people, which is great. And we're doing exactly what you said. If, if you know, if it's something that works for you, you know, continue to do it. Yeah. Which is, I think, great advice. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah, we're looking forward to uh, digging deeper, learning more about ourselves. And one of the things we just recently did was, you know, go out and get some blood work and saliva and also fecal testing mm -hmm. to see where all of our levels are yes. and what our bodies individually specifically need. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and that's good. Yeah. I mean, biomarker testing, like, it, of course, like, it's not perfect right now for a lot of things, but it's something, you know, it's better mm -hmm. than nothing. And, yeah. the, you know, one of the unfortunate things about biomarker testing is that just a lot of people can't afford it. And so in that way, it's not mm -hmm. available to them. But there are, you know, what is available, like I said, it's not perfect, but it is something. So mm -hmm. if you get enough, enough different biomarkers from different places, then, you know, you can piece together pretty good regimens and plans for yourself. And so if yeah. you can afford to do it and it's available to you, then it's a good idea to do from time to time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you yes. so much for joining us tonight. I mean, I appreciate it. you're a wealth of knowledge. Like I, I literally could probably sit down with you and just talk to you for like 10 hours straight yeah. <laughs> because this is absolutely the stuff that I nerd out on. Yeah. So yeah, maybe we can do that sometime, you know, <laughs> your little coaching again. session. Gotta do it. Gotta yes. do it. For yes, sure. absolutely. Absolutely. So thank you so much for taking the time out to be here with us tonight. And, uh, yeah, we'll make sure to have you back. I mean, it's always, I always learn things. So, you know, mm -hmm. it's absolutely. always great when I can yeah. learn something. <laughs> Definitely. Can you tell everyone where they can find you? Yes. Um, mostly right now, mostly on Insta Instagram, Dr. William Wallace. And, you know, I engage on a lot of the other social networks. And I think pretty soon, <clears throat> excuse me, pretty soon here, uh, I did just start a podcast myself. But right now I'm operating on uh, a monthly upload schedule because of the amount of work that has to go into doing it and the style yeah. that I'm doing it in. So in the winter, it's going to be uh, a weekly occurrence, uh, mm -hmm. but I have some work obligations that I have to get through before I can dedicate that kind of time to it. So in the near future, I'll be like more of my content will be coming from 
uh, YouTube more than likely. But as of right now, Instagram is the main place where people can actually find and engage with me. Okay. Yes, Fantastic. and make sure you guys all follow him and, and go look at his page because y'all can y'all can get a lot of answers from his answers. page. <laughs> yes, and I drop his IG tag. again, and we can't wait to have you back. Mm -hmm. uh, we appreciate you so much, yep. and yeah, we'll see you next time, Doctor. Right. <laughs> yeah, thank you guys. Always a pleasure. All right, thank, all you. Right. thank you, thank you. Wow. All right. That was good. Yeah. Oh man, good. that was amazing. Large that was amazing. Yes, it was. Wow. What I like about his information is the fact that um, he gives you the professional uh, side of it. Yeah. Uh, non biased. He's right. giving you actual just facts. Yeah, non biased. In other words, facts. these studies were done. These yeah. studies were kind of inconclusive. These studies were dead on. Mm -hmm. He's giving you that information, mm -hmm. non biased, so that the person listening can go do their own research and make their own educated decisions. Yes. Based on what that they feel their body likes. But at the same time, not telling you, don't do this, don't do that. Mm -hmm. You know, you shouldn't be doing this. You shouldn't be doing that. Or, right. Or, you know, take my stuff. Yeah, no. Nah. So that's what I like about it. Non-bias, exactly. It's just information. Like He's just information. a wealth of information. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, this 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 podcast provided a lot of people with a lot of different things that you guys can dig into, research mm -hmm. for yourself. Yeah. I mean, just, just wow. Yeah, a lot of good stuff. <laughs> just I, I wow. just love the non-bias. And, you know, yeah. he's not uh, an esoteric wizard. He's not, you know, mm -hmm. he's not a, a, a guru on aliens or, <laughs> uh, or ancient civilizations. Yeah. He's just a doctor that uh, sees things slightly differently than most people in the mainstream mm -hmm. community uh, who's spent a lot of time researching and studying and producing yes. uh, healthy supplements that can that help people yep. in a positive way mm -hmm. and gives his honest uh, honest opinion based on scientific evidence and research. Yeah. And as you guys can tell, he is well studied. Okay. Yeah. Well studied, well read. I mean, this guy looks up case studies. He's part of case studies. So, I mean, yeah. you know, the information, you know, that what he puts out is well researched, mm -hmm. well Absolutely. researched. Yeah. Yes. Great, great, yes. great job. Yeah. Great job. I think I so. It. Is there anything that we need to talk about, tell people about? Well, do you want to tell them about the raffle? Which one? We got a couple going. <laughs> well, I know. Well, no, we only have the Mercedes Benz raffle. Oh, okay. Yeah. The okay. Yeah, that raffle. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because that's a giving away. Giving away, right? Yeah. So we got a raffle, you guys, yeah. and we have a giveaway. Yeah. So the raffle that we have is um, it's in there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. There you go. Okay. Yeah. So we are raffling off my previously owned Mercedes Benz, and oh, it's not in here. Where did yeah, it go? So I don't That's know. weird. You know what? Let's yeah. go over to Forbidden Knowledge. Okay. Um, yes. So, you guys, I'm raffling off my previously owned Mercedes Benz uh, AMG. And here you go. Mm -hmm. um, yes, it has less than 14,000 miles on it, full warranty. Um, the sound system is amazing. And yeah, it's it's super fire. You guys take it, check it. So check that out. Yes, it is fire is fast. Hey, what up though, Nikki? Nikki speaks in the building. I see you. Up, I see Nikki? you, girl. Um, yes, no, you guys, this this car is phenomenal. It's smooth, it's amazing, it's fast, it's it's affordable, it has red leather interior. Um, it has that sports wheel with the flat bottom, which actually is what sold me on the car in the mm -hmm. first place. Yeah. Um, and then also the good thing about this raffle is a portion of the proceeds go to Communities and Schools Michigan, okay? And Communities and Schools is a organization, a nonprofit that helps underprivileged children not only with backpacks, not only with extra clothes yeah. and coats, but tutoring, but mentoring. And I'm talking not just tutoring and mentoring for just the moment in time. I'm talking about these people, these mentors 
take these kids on at very, very young ages mm -hmm. and then bring them all the way through graduation. That's okay. Right. Yes. And it's one of the, the nonprofits that Billy actually agreed to support with me because we personally, my mother, <laughs> she is on the board. Okay. The board of this nonprofit and she is the secretary on the board. So we know exactly mm -hmm. where the money goes. Yep. And it's not one of those nonprofits that the money goes just in the pockets of the people, right? Mm -hmm. Like 90% of what is donated to this organization gets thrown at the kids, gets put into the kids. Yes. Yes. That's what makes it so great. Absolutely. A lot of nonprofits, you know, unfortunately, they keep a lot of the money for uh, salaries. Mm -hmm. And they really have gotten down to a bare bones situation just to yes. take care of the basic needs of the people that are actually working, like their gas that they need for their car and, yeah. and so forth. Things that they need to get around to go see these kids and help these kids. And the rest of the money all goes to the kids. 90% to the kids, 10% to administration. Mm. That's unheard of. And it's an amazing program. Yes. And that's actually where all the chat donations and everything else goes to. Mm -hmm. uh, we just gave them $5,000 a donation at the first annual Forbidden Conscious Awards yes. live on stage yes, just the other day. And that was a culmination of a lot of the donations we got here from your YouTube uh, chat donations. So yeah, thank yeah. you for helping us out with that. Absolutely. But you can continue to help out by getting a raffle ticket for $44 and you might win this Mercedes-Benz AMG. Mm -hmm. on, the foot, on the flip side, you actually are helping kids at the same time. So mm -hmm. it's a win-win situation yeah. because of the positive karma that you're generating and, uh, you know, we've given away a Ford Sport. We've given away a Rolls Royce Ghost. We've given away an Audi A4, which just a few weeks ago, live at the first annual Forbidden Conscious Awards. Mm -hmm. And now we're giving away this uh, Mercedes-Benz AMG. Yes, yes. So make sure you guys get your ticket. We'll be um, calling that winner probably in the next couple months. And then should we talk about what we're doing? Yeah, let's tell With them. the other one. You want to tell them what we're doing with the other car? So exciting, guys. Oh, this is great news. It's really great news. There's another car that we're giving away. We have a convertible Bentley Continental. Yeah. And in order to win that car, yes. you have to be an active subscriber of Forbidden Knowledge TV. Mm -hmm. And then you also have to actually watch 10 shows. And in those 10 shows that we specify, there's going to be... Um, 10 gems that you're going to have to mark the actual timestamps to in those shows on the special form we're going to have you fill out. And so this is for subscribers only. Mm -hmm. And once you fill out the gems, the, 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 the 10 uh, timestamps, name the shows, and of course, be an active subscriber, your name is then put into the drawing to win the convertible Bentley. All right. I thought I had a little video clip over here, but maybe I didn't. I don't. Did you upload it? I thought I did upload it. Oh. Here. I was going to show them. I'm pretty sure I did. Man, this I, Bentley is so nice, you guys. Yeah, the, bottom. the whole launch, though. Oh, here I it is. It. Oh, oh, yeah. Take a look Check at it this. Hey, listen, right. listen, who else does stuff like this, though? Nobody. No one else does stuff Nobody's like, yo, you guys, this is fun. Like, this yeah. is fun stuff mm -hmm. that I'm so happy to be a part of. Like, I just I love I love the interaction, you know, mm -hmm. of this community yeah. and and what you've really built with with everything that you do. Because, I mean, honestly, you guys, this is this is the thing I could have traded in the Benz. OK, but instead we want to involve people. And mm -hmm. also, not only can I now get a new car, right? Because the Benz will be paid off. Someone will win the car, okay? So uh, someone gets blessed. Mm -hmm. Not, And then we get to help kids as well. Yeah. Like, it's a win-win situation. Yeah. Now, with the Bentley, we were, like, thinking about what to do with this with this Bentley. And I was like, hmm, mm -hmm. how, do we, how do we involve the people, right? right? And so we talked about it, and mm -hmm. this is what we came up with. Yeah, I love so it. So a subscriber of Forbidden Knowledge TV 
will win a Bentley, okay? Yeah. Like for free. Like this is fun stuff. Yeah. And it's basically like a game. Like you do have to watch some shows and answer some questions and get it right. Mm -hmm. But then you'll be inside of the raffle of the whoever wins the Bentley. Exactly. This is amazing. I mean, it's amazing, yeah. fun stuff. Yeah. Who does this? Nobody like, does it. A person that was in the audience at the Conscious Awards won a basically, um, it was almost brand new yeah. Audi. Audi, yeah. Like, Audi A4 Turbo. she was so excited that she literally almost tripped on her dress running down the aisle oh to go God. get the key on stage. Like, yeah. this stuff is cool, man. <laughs> People were crying because of the emotion oh, man, that she so let out when she yes. won that car. She's just a person sitting in the audience at the Conscious Awards, and we gave away a, a brand new Audi to a random yeah. winner at the at the show. Yeah. And uh, her her personal car was the 2004, uh, I think she said a Honda Civic that mm -hmm. had no AC and was breaking down every week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it's amazing. The first car we gave away, that Ford Sport, the girl was a DJ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She didn't have a, her car broke down, didn't have a car to continue working. That car yes. got her back working again. Uh -huh. The second person. Uh, who won the raffle for the Mercedes uh, for, no, for the Rolls Royce, Royce Ghost? Rolls Royce. Uh, he was actually sleeping on an air mattress, homeless, lost his wife mm -hmm. and his house during COVID. Ended up uh, his business went down the tubes. Mm -hmm. He was able to uh, sell the car after taxes, got eighty eight thousand dollars, and then was able to uh, get an apartment, get an inexpensive car and invest back into his business. And I mentored him a little bit. Mm -hmm. And now he's got a thriving business and company. Mm -hmm. uh, the third person was the young lady who won the Audi A4, who was driving around in a 2004 broken down car with no AC in the middle of summer in Texas is where mm -hmm. she's from. Mm -hmm. I allowed her to drive the car back. I said, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to leave my insurance on the car and my tag on the car. But the moment you get to Texas, make sure you send me my tag back. And she FedExed me the tag and I canceled my insurance. Uh, she did exactly what we wanted to do, thankfully. So thank you so much for listening and, and, and following through on that. And she then called me from the tag agency where she had the title and everything transferred into her name. Mm -hmm. uh, so and we'll have her on the podcast soon as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, now it's the it's the Mercedes Benz AMG, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, Elizabeth's car, a former car that we're now raffling off. And then. After that, it's going to be the convertible Bentley. Yes. Always doing fun stuff. Yeah. And then next year, we got something special. We're going to be doing an investment property. We're going to give away oh, an investment yes. property with renters already in the property. Yes. Listen, see, that's fire. <laughs> that's some fire stuff because that's yeah. literally building someone up. OK, you're mm -hmm. not you're not only blessing somebody with with something, yeah. but this now can set somebody up. To make residual income. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is this fire stuff, man. Yeah. This is fire stuff. Nobody's doing this and nobody no. will do it. Mm -mm. No, nope. nobody will do it. No. Nope. And the logic behind it for us is I could take that money. I could take the money that I use to buy the uh the Bentley, for example. Mm -hmm. I can invest that money into into ads, online mm -hmm. paid advertisement, right? For Google and, and, and other locations, social media ads, mm -hmm. Instagram, Facebook, and get minimal results. Yeah. Yeah. Or I can spend that money on the car and hype that up and get better results mm -hmm. and improve people's lives. Mm -hmm. Because you can get that Bentley and you can sell it for cash instantaneously the same day you get it mm -hmm. and uh, and walk away with money. Or you can invest that money. Or you can say, hey, I got a Bentley. Let me drive it around for a little while. You know, Let me enjoy this. I'm enjoy mm -hmm. life a little bit. Whatever you want. Same thing with the Mercedes Benz. Yep. That Mercedes Benz is a car that an average person, I believe, can keep. It's got a warranty on it. Mm -hmm. So the Mercedes has a has a factory Mercedes Benz warranty on the car. Yes. All right. So, I mean, you know, so it's just, look, come on. Nobody's going to do this kind of stuff. No, no. They're we not do it do over it. here for bit knowledge, though. Yeah, that's <laughs> we right. We do it over here for bit knowledge. Um, yes, make sure you guys get the Forbidden Knowledge TV app. There is over, um, right around 4,000 shows on the app. Um, really, really high quality stuff. We produced about eight this year so far. I think we did 12 the year prior. Um, next year is so exciting because we are going to be launching Billy's new show, the Anunnaki series, and we're going to be doing a movie theater tour. Mm -hmm. So you guys will see us, all your cities. Um, and yeah, it's just going to be an exciting year next year. Exciting year. And yeah. I, I just saw Frank said he was going to be in the blueprint for God power part two. Mm -hmm. And that's coming up. We definitely would love to have you guys on the Blueprint for God Power. Check this out. Would you like a different destination? Are you ready to be the captain of the ship? 
we're going to challenge people. So when you can combine spiritual concepts with financial literacy, then you really tap into your God power. We are navigating through multiple matrices. Once you do this workshop, it's going to take everything in your being to not become the person that you came to be. And with that being said, I dropped the link to the blueprint, blueprint for God Power Part Two in the live chat. Yeah, and we're signing out. Yeah. Oh yes, we're signing out, guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's dinner time. <laughs> All right. Peace. Yes. Yes. Peace. Peace.